Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I want to talk about uh, more is not better. All right? A common misperception regarding nutrition is that more is better. For example, if a little bit of a nutrient in food is a good idea, then the, same, the, the logic goes that a whole lot more or thousands of times more must be even better for, for health. And, and of course, um, we have a lot of folks out there promoting supplements and fortified foods saying this is the only way you can get enough of some of these nutrients. It sounds right. Higher intake of isolated nutrients sounds like a good idea, but it just, as like, like with many things in real practice, doesn't turn out to be. It can actually make things worse. Now we'll talk about calcium. According to many experts and government agencies, women who are 50 or younger should consume 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day, and women over 50, 1,200 milligrams a day in order to maintain healthy bones. And again, the supplement sellers and promoters of fortified foods promote their products as a way of getting this calcium. It's a pretty high amount they're recommending. Um, but a growing body of evidence shows that this is not the case. In fact, many studies show that higher calcium intake is associated with increased, not decreased, fracture risk. In one study, Chinese researchers looked at calcium intake and fracture risk in older men and women who were eating a mostly plant-based diet. So we're starting with people who are eating pretty well to begin with. Researchers reported that calcium intake higher than 778 milligrams a day or lower than 275 milligrams a day increased the fracture risk for men. For women, the numbers were a little bit different. Calcium intake higher than 651 milligrams or lower than 248 milligrams per day increased the fracture risk. In other words, very low and very high calcium intake is um, not good for bones and probably not good for some other things too. The World Health Organization recommends 400 to 500 milligrams a day for calcium and also states that there is no benefit um, for intake at uh, higher levels. The National Health Service in the United Kingdom recommends 700 milligrams a day. And on their website, it's interesting, their guidelines as to how to get this calcium include a lot of non-dairy sources such as green leafy vegetables, soybeans, tofu, and nuts. U.S. researchers are coming around a little bit. Dr. Walter Willett, chair of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, says that women would be better off if they consumed less calcium. The recommendation to consume 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day for postmenopausal women was not supported by evidence at the time that it was initially established. Instead, researchers hypothesized that taking in more calcium would result in higher blood levels of calcium, which would then, in turn, keep the body from accessing stored calcium in the bones to buffer acidity. The researchers just didn't take into consideration things like uh, nutrient absorption relies on a lot of factors, not just intake, uh, but the combination of foods consumed, the health of the gut microbiota, the overall dietary pattern. They also failed to consider that when calcium intake is too high, the body restricts calcium absorption in order to prevent the deposition of excess calcium in the arteries and the soft tissues of the body. The amount of calcium or any other nutrient consumed is not necessarily an indication of how much is going to get absorbed into the system and then used. And so this is a great example of when you sit around and hypothesize about things instead of waiting for well-structured studies to show you the answers to important questions, you can often lead people in absolutely the wrong direction. Well, people who eat a well-structured plant-based diet can easily consume enough calcium from food, particularly at the number that seems to be right, which is somewhere around 500 milligrams a day. For example, a medium-sized orange contains 100 milligrams of calcium and four ounces of broccoli contains 112 milligrams. Well-structured plant-based diets are also lower in protein, which reduces the release of calcium from the bones. And smaller amounts of calcium from food result in stronger bones than larger amounts of calcium from supplements. So it just goes to show you more is not better. Now, we were talking about money, it'd be a little bit different situation, but we're talking about calcium. We're talking about nutrients from food. All right, the next thing is highly disturbing. You know, if you've ever gone to a doctor and said, how come my doctor is pushing these drugs? Why doesn't my doctor understand nutrition? Um, why does he seem to be wrong about so many things, or she? Now, this will give you a clue. Clinical practice guidelines, or CPGs, are supposed to be developed by researchers who read the medical literature to determine the risks and the benefits of treatments, evaluate treatment results over the short term and the long term, and take into consideration various types of individuals with varying degrees of illness. 
And then this information is all packaged up and used by doctors to guide recommendations to patients. And if it were evidence-based, that would be fine. The need for these guidelines was really, really began back in the 1980s when it became apparent that there was a lot of variation in the quality of studies and, um, and uh, the, the type of information in medical journals. Now, doctors are supposed to practice evidence-based medicine, and they've always been expected to do that. Um, but in the past, doctors had historically exercised their own judgment. That led to variability. And in this rush to standardize medicine, and then probably some things should be standardized, but I think we're standardizing the wrong things. Uh, but in the rush to standardize, CPGs would be more objective and provide a foundation for reviewing options with patients. Well, over the years, policies were developed to address conflicts of interest since so many of the experts who are appointed to committees that look at this type of thing have financial ties to drug companies. But the um, researchers or the committee members, I should say, who are on these committees do not always disclose their industry ties. And most of the medical associations that um, organize these committees also have these types of conflicts and um, they rarely disclose their conflicts of interest uh, either. The Institute of Medicine recommends that Every single guideline should be accompanied by a disclosure of both direct and indirect funding for both committee members who develop the, the guideline and also the association sponsoring the committee. Once CPGs are developed, they're published in medical journals, they're widely distributed to doctors, they're used in medical school. The unfortunate part is a lot of doctors still don't know that there are conflicts of interest with CPGs. Now, to evaluate the extent of the problem, researchers approached 95 medical organizations that had published 290 clinical guidelines during the calendar year 2012 with a survey. Two-thirds of these uh, 95 groups were professional organizations, and then 20% were disease or condition groups. 68 of the organizations responded, representing 58% of the clinical guidelines published. While 63% of the medical organizations had received industry funding, only 1% of the guidelines were accompanied by statements disclosing those relationships. Only 51% of the guidelines included disclosure statements from committee members. It's almost impossible to believe that these types of relationships don't make a difference in outcomes. I mean, this is the reason why drug and device makers invest in things like medical societies and disease groups and uh, they hire academic experts, it's specifically to increase their sales. Senior author of this research study I just described, Henry Selfox, says that industry funding can influence the guidelines and physicians should look at the guidelines with, quote, a little less confidence and a little more skepticism. Amen to that. The researchers found that 80% of the organizations had policies regarding conflicts of interest, but less than half had policies related to the development of practice guidelines. They also found that the stronger the groups were in terms of their um, uh, guidelines for such things, the more likely there were to be disclosures, uh, the less likely they would be to make positive recommendations where drugs and devices were concerned, and actually 32% more likelihood that a negative statement might be made about drugs and devices. While guidelines from these groups were likely to include disclosures for committee members, none of them disclosed the organization's financial ties to industry. Now, just to give you an example of how pervasive this can be, the American Psychiatric Association started appointing committees to develop CPGs in 1991. In 2009, a review of the CPG panels for the treatment of depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia showed that 18 out of 20 members had financial ties to drug companies whose products were recommended as first-line treatments. For bipolar disease, 100% of the panel members had ties. None of these financial ties were disclosed in the CPGs that were issued by the committees. In 2010, six panel members had a total of 120 relationships to drug companies. The guidelines are followed by psychiatrists, family practice doctors. They're used to train medical students to guide public policy um, development concerning mental health. This is too important to be essentially done by representatives of drug companies. I think the situation like this, like this one um, and so many of, things that I, of the things that I talk about in these video clips really illustrates the need for patients to be informed. They can't count on doctors most of the time for objective information. In fact, most of the time, doctors don't know the extent of the corruption that influences the recommendations they make. So power to the patient. That's why we're here, to help patients make better decisions. Informed medical decision-making, that's what ultimately is going to save people from modern medicine. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.